All right, let's come together to the Word, and I am going to talk about marriage. Now, I run a huge risk the minute I say that, because we got a lot of single people, and I know a lot of single people are saying, oh, I can tune out. Why didn't I know ahead of time? I don't have to be there. So let me respond with a few qualifiers. First, our series is meant to look at wisdom from Jesus about a lot of areas where there's confusion. And I think we would agree there's a lot of confusion today about marriage. Last week it was about identity. Where do we find our identity? And we need to know that. This week it's marriage. Next week, singles, you get your turn because it's all about singleness. And the gift God gives that some of you wish would not keep on giving and others of you are saying, others of you are saying that it's a great gift but many don't understand and there's a lot of confusion about singleness. And then later on, we're going to talk about other relationships. But let me just say, this is in keeping with our series. Second, you may not be married, but marriages around you affect you. And their success may have an impact on you and those you love. So you should be glad we're trying to help married people, even giving you instruction that may help you help them. You may hope to marry, and so this should be helpful counsel. There are instructions to married people that are also applicable to those who are not married, and I hope you'll see this. And, and then the thing you need to understand is the great hero that's going to be throughout this message, the great hero is, in fact, a single person, Jesus. So we're going to talk about all of that. But at, before we begin, let's read the first text we're going to look at out of three today. We're only going to read one of them. I would ask you to stand with me as we read together Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 to 9. Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 to 9. Let's honor God's word even now as we read it together. Matthew 19. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to our hearts. You can be seated. What a text to start with. We'll come back to it in just a moment. To say that there is confusion, though, about the nature and purposes of marriage today, in, and that kind of fits with our series, it's a bit of an understatement. As I'm talking to God's family, I probably don't have to convince you that marriage is important. It's supposed to be lifelong. It's God's institution. It's not man's invention. And only between one man and one woman. If any of these is truly not understood by you or you're thinking, wait a minute, I, I don't get... I, honestly, I would love to engage with you further on those questions in the Bible, but, but that's not my primary purpose today. We say that marriage is important. In fact, we say it's very important, but sometimes we, we overemphasize it to the point where you'd think it's the only truly blessed state of adulthood. And next week, I'll try and address that. But aside from that, within the church of Jesus, I find a lot of confusion. I've asked staff and others to give me feedback and to, to give me uh, just some of the things they have heard and see about marriage and and. and 
man, there are some strange ideas out there, even among Christians, even among Christians we may know. You know, data has been collected that tells us that Christians are not immune from marriage failure. The good news is that according to all the statistics we can find, that if you are a Bible-believing Christian and you are regularly engaged in church and fellowship, you are much less likely uh, to have your marriage fail than those in a larger population. These, messages, these marriages, I should say, fail according to statistics at a rate 35% less than people who have no religious affiliation. So I suppose the good news is it helps, but, you know, 35% better isn't the greatest, is it? And the fact is we all know that, that marriage failure does take place because in a fallen world... Things God didn't want to break get broken. Some are rejoicing in the falling divorce rate in our country. Did you know the rate is falling? Well, it is. But you know why? Because fewer and fewer people are getting married. If you trace the the divorce rate, you see it going down, but you look at the rate of marriages and you see this as well. Why? Because more and more people are simply saying, I don't see the benefit. Why get married? Why not just live together? And the rate of people living together is just exploding. It, it, it's never been this high in our, in our country or our culture, and it just keeps going up. As I asked single and married people for feedback, I got some interesting feedback. A couple of single people told me that they, that they know a whole lot of young men who believe they need to get married because marriage is the solution to the purity problem. Because Paul says it is better to marry than to burn with passion. They assume that marriage will put the fire out or at least direct it. And there won't be any problem again. Well, I hate to break it to you, but that's not true. And there are a whole lot of married men who are still struggling with pornography, still struggling with lust, still not focused in holy passion toward their wives and obviously, more importantly, toward God. Uh, Other singles have uh, informed me, especially uh, women singles, have informed me that many of their women friends have unrealistic unrealistic expectations and visions of how their men will change once they say, I do. He may not be all that romantic or all that spiritual or all that ambitious or all that, and you can fill in the blank. But once he's married, he'll step up to the plate. Um, Once again, that is a horrible way to think. Because you need to understand when you're dating and when you're getting ready for marriage, that's like the, the time when you're working hardest to impress one another. Falls apart often after that. What you see before you get married is what you'll see afterward. I've I've heard from married people who've said one of their concerns is that often both men and women have the expectation that the other person will somehow complete them. That this other person will somehow make up for all of their deficiencies and all of their weaknesses and and that together they will be something amazing. And you know, there, there is... There is truth to the idea that the bringing together of a man and woman in marriage creates a one flesh relationship where there's tremendous potential and possibility. But the idea that somehow this completion involves making you more spiritual or making you more whatever it is that you want to be. In fact, other married people have have commented, and I say a hearty amen here, No one prepares you for the shock of the discovery of just how selfish you are when you get married. You know, you think you're you're not that selfish, and then you get married, and now all of a sudden two sinners are living in close proximity all the time. You know, when you're dating, you get a little frustrated, you get a little tired, well, it's time for me to go. Not once you're married. And a lot of married people seem to think that that this is going to be easier to be selfless. Frankly, the reality of our self-focus doesn't diminish in marriage, and often the circumstances of marriage cause it to increase, and we begin to wonder, why is this person doing this to me? Why is this person not meeting my needs? You know, it's tough for selfish, sinful people to navigate a new world of oneness. A colleague of mine noted just 
the fact that the lack of spiritual initiative on the part of many men is a key plague in our Christian homes. You know, men don't want to look stupid. Men want to look like they're in charge. But oftentimes they realize, you know, my wife knows a whole lot more about Scripture than I do. And so rather than draw on that, and rather than do something like saying to your wife, you know, I need to make a decision about this for us, and I'd love your input. What, what you know from the Scripture would be really helpful. Rather than draw on that, it's like, nope. And the man just decides... He's not going to talk about spiritual things. He's not going to initiate things. He's not going to initiate prayer because he doesn't feel like he prays as well as she does. He's not going to initiate Bible reading because he's not sure he'll get all the pronunciations right. He's not going to do any number of things because he's the man and he's not going to look weak. And that lack of initiative on the part of men often means just a a breakdown in terms of the spiritual growth of a couple. Many people think that getting married makes communication simple. So often it does not. There are so many times. I mean, even even for Kathy and I, there are times where in our communication, we think we're being very, very clear. But we're not. I mean, there are times when I think I've, I've made it very clear, but I've been so subtle it just kind of right under the radar and, and nothing was there perhaps. Or sometimes Kathy is telling me something, but we've been talking about things and, and the subject changed and I didn't catch that the subject changed and, and I'm just completely confused. And man, there are just times we've been married 35 years and we still have times when we misunderstand each other. And sometimes that could be not pretty. Well, these and other thoughts and understandings stem in one way or another from a lack of understanding, I think, of of just the incredible privilege, in fact, a great privilege and purpose in marriage that we often miss. Marriages exist for wonderful, great purposes far beyond just physical intimacy, although it includes that, not beyond just having children for some, if, if it includes that, Beyond lack of loneliness, there, there, are, there are amazing purposes Jesus has for our marriages. And, and somehow we think by getting married, we've kind of completed the deal without realizing that, that once a couple is married, they're just beginning the walk of fulfilling those purposes. And if we don't know the purposes, we don't know the goals, the targets, we're not going to hit them because we're not even trying. And so today, I, I want to talk about how Jesus, a single man, in loving the world, gives us understandings about marriage that give it purpose that sometimes we miss but we must grab onto. So I'm going to tell you three things today. The first, the first is simply we're going to see Jesus answer a current question, and that's what we see in Matthew 19. He's going to answer that, cur- uh, that current question, and I'll explain what that answer was, and then real quickly, and then we'll move into what his approved source for marriage information is. Where, where, do, you, where do you go for this, Jesus? What, what gives you the right to answer this contemporary question in this way? And he, and he shows us. And then third, and where I want to spend the, the most time, is helping us understand the significant purpose that Jesus has for marriage permanence. Because I, I don't know if you caught it, but you know, after Jesus quoted Genesis 2 and how a man should leave his father and mother and and be joined to his wife, and there'll be one flesh. Jesus added this comment, and we hear it in almost every wedding. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Why? Why? Well, we'll we'll look at that. But let's look first at this whole idea of of Jesus' answer to a current question. So if you have your uh, copy of the Scripture open to Matthew 19, we're just going to reference it really quickly. You notice that the Pharisees showed up as Jesus had been healing people, and it says the Pharisees came to test him to ask him about divorce. Now, Matthew really helps us here because Matthew is in a Jewish context, and and he quotes the whole thing. Mark isn't quite so concerned. He doesn't give the whole quote, uh, and, and, and yet 
uh, this was the understanding behind it. I'm so thankful for the different gospels that spell these things out. In a Jewish context, the Pharisees who kept the law and kept track of the law asked Jesus, is it, li- is it lawful to divorce your wife for any cause? That last phrase, for any cause, is so important. Because about 100 years before Jesus, the thinking of the Pharisees had been changed by a very influential rabbi. He'd come along and said, you know that passage back in Deuteronomy where it talked about if you find a cause of indecency in your wife, well, and you could divorce her. Well, the indecency, everybody knew, had something to do with immorality. He says, it's not a cause of, it's it's a cause or... So he said, you could divorce your wife for any cause. According to D.A. Carson, it could include such things, according to the rabbinic literature, as burning the toast. According to Hillel's rule, only men could divorce this way, but any cause you found that said, I don't want to be married to her, you simply took a certificate and you wrote out, I have divorced so-and-so, and you handed it to them, and they had to leave. Been around for about 100 years. No fault divorce. No fault divorce. Hadn't existed among Jews before that. But now it did, and it, and it really matched all the cultures around them because all the other cultures had lots of divorces going on. People could marry and divorce and remarry and divorce and all of that. So now the Jews were doing it for about 100 years. There was a smaller group of rabbis who said, no, 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 that's misreading this. And so they put Jesus to the test. Why are they trying to test him in front of a crowd? Well, because this new view of divorce was very popular, especially for men. So can you divorce for any cause? And what does Jesus say? Well, he takes a little while to say it. He says, no. No. You cannot divorce for any cause. Why? Jesus does hear what he often does in answering questions. And and brothers and sisters, this this is model for all of us. He appeals to the scriptures. He goes back to Genesis. Specifically, Genesis 1 and 2. He speaks from Scripture. Why? Well, because, brothers and sisters, that's Jesus speaking too. And we talk about this in a lot of different ways. You've heard us talk about creation, how the whole Trinity was involved in creation, how the Father had this will that was being worked out, and how the Spirit was that energy of creation hovering on the waters. But do you remember how often it says, and God said, and God said, and God said? And most theologians say that's a reference to the second person of the Trinity. So if you want to hear Jesus speaking to the issue of marriage, you don't just have to look at Matthew or John. You can look all the way back to Genesis. And you hear Jesus speaking. That's his approved source of marriage information. It's not the culture. It's not the hard circumstances today. It's not whether or not people feel that that times have really changed. Brothers and sisters, in so many theological questions today... The confusion always begins to enter in when we do not look at the Scriptures first and say, well, what do the Scriptures say? And, of course, it's kind of embarrassing when Jesus tells the, goes to the Pharisees, well, well what, what does the Scripture say? And, frankly, he quotes it for them and says to them, you need to remember this. So look at his approved source of marriage information. Go back to Genesis 1 and 2. And we're only going to spend a few moments here because like I said, we've got one more passage that really will get the lion's share of our time. In Genesis 1 and 2, we have simply that record of creation of man and woman. He goes back to Genesis and in Recording what God said or reminding him of what God said and what God did, it's Jesus speaking. And what do we find? We find God said, let us make man in our image, verse 26 of chapter 1, and after our likeness. And so it says in verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So the participants of this creation are male and female, created different, but but complementary, and this is meant to reflect the image of God in lots of ways, but not the least of which God exists in relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so the, in creating humanity, he creates male and female, distinct from one another, complementary, but, but for them to relate together and to together be the image of God in this creation. In chapter 2, when God speaks, and of course, this is once again, most likely, the second person of the Trinity speaking in chapter 2, when it says, for this cause, 
a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Notice the parameters are a man and a woman. Again, not too terribly confusing. And since God knows all things and knows all possibilities, to make this general pronouncement, it's pretty clear he's saying we have male and female who who present the image of God and a man and a woman who together can become one flesh before God. And the reason for that in chapter 2, the reason for the creation of woman to be joined with man is that aloneness is not good. Now, it's not just the aloneness of not being married. It's the aloneness of Adam was utterly alone. And by the creation of woman, he not only created one who would be his partner, but through the birth of children and the the multiplication of humanity, he creates community that we all live in together. So aloneness is dealt with in this. And the, the union that's created, this new thing that God makes, When a man and a woman are joined together in marriage is what is called one flesh. Now, that is not just the idea of physical intimacy. In fact, I'd argue that's just physical intimacy is just a a outward portrayal of it. One flesh is the idea that there's a very real sense in which these two in this union were meant to come to a soul oneness. That is incredibly unique. Two different people coming together and and being brought together to create something new. As God did this, the result, we're told at the end, was a union that was one where people could be totally themselves without fear because we see they were naked and they were unashamed. There is so much in our lives that we try to hide, but in this, in this relationship in the beginning, there was a relationship that could be totally open, totally honest, no shame. But in answering the Pharisees' question about divorce, he says, divorce was permitted by Moses Not created by Moses, by the way. It just shows up in the Old Testament as happening, and then Moses gives rules for it. It says, Moses permitted it because of hardness of heart, the hardness of your hearts. Now, he's not there saying that if you happen to be in a marriage that where, where there's a brokenness that exists and a brokenness so severe that one party leaves, this is not to say that the person who was left has somehow some deficiency and hardness of heart. Divorce happens because of hardness of heart, therefore that's... No. The, the origins of hardness of heart go back to Genesis 3, where mankind decided we would be our own God. We would make our own rules. We would, we would decide what's good and bad for us. And, and God is telling us things... And we said, no. God says, don't eat. We said, I'll eat if I want to. And that kind of hardness of heart, not primarily toward each other, but first and foremost toward God, led to the brokenness of relationship with God and relationship with one another. What happened when they disobeyed? Adam blames God. Eve actually blames God for Eve, and then Eve blames the serpent. And we know if you read Genesis 3, it just gets worse. In fact, the story gets worse basically until God intervenes and begins to turn the tide through Jesus and ultimately bring us to that wonderful end in Revelation. But boy, from Genesis onward, there's a lot of bad, a lot of hard heart. Jesus said to the Pharisees, no, 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 no. He says, the brokenness that that you're talking about and the reason you'd even try and create something that would make divorce so easy is you're you're, you're missing the point. God has created a wonderful gift and a gift that is meant, ideally, to last forever. 
throughout life, when I say forever, until, until death, as we say in our marriage vows, do us part. Now, what's interesting is he says, what God has joined together, let no man separate, and then he goes right on to talk about, and by the way, you can divorce for this reason. So in one sense, he's not saying by saying what God has joined together, let no man put asunder, that means it will never happen. No, in fact, he says in a fallen world, in a broken world, sinners sin. And sometimes they sin against the one they promised to be with forever. They break the covenant. And when that happens, we mourn. But aren't you thankful for a God of grace who says, in the words of Jesus, I recognize this. I see this. But it doesn't keep him from saying, there's purpose in marriage lasting forever. And to see that, we have to go beyond the cross because here in Matthew and in the Gospels, Jesus is demonstrating his love for the world. And ultimately, he's going to demonstrate that love for the world by sacrificing himself and dying for us and bringing into being a whole new group of people called the church. But we have to wait until after Jesus does all of that for him to reveal through the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5 an incredible mystery that we did not know. And that's where we see Jesus' significant purpose for marriage permanence. Turn to Ephesians 5. Again, a passage I have often used for marriage sermons, talking to husbands about living this way and talking to wives about living this way. And I think it's an important challenge for us. But there's a, there's a little section in, in Ephesians 5 that tells us something amazing. In, in, in 5.22, it says to wives, by the way, this is in a whole section where it talks about learning how to do what we ought to do for one another. Verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear or reverence of Christ. So how do we do that? Well, wives... You submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And then in verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And there's a whole description of how Christ loved the church. But then get down with me to um, verse 31. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There's Jesus speaking in the creation, Genesis 2. There's Jesus speaking in Matthew 19. But now Paul by inspiration of the Holy Spirit says something more that has never been said before. Look at it. This mystery, stop right there, underline that word mystery. Anytime you see the word mystery in the New Testament, the New Testament writer is saying, here's something we didn't understand before. Here's something we didn't know before or hasn't been fully revealed before like the mystery in another place of Christ in you, the hope of glory. People didn't understand that before. Well, look at this. Here's another mystery. He says, this mystery is profound. And what I'm saying is that it, what? This whole thing he's just said about husbands loving their wives and wives submitting to their church, to, to, the, to the Lord as, as the church as the Christ. He says, I am saying this, it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You know, we come to this passage all the time and we think primarily it's meant for husbands toward wives and wives toward husbands. But what Paul is saying is that is secondary. And you know, I'm just amazed at how easily I've missed this over the years. Look at Ephesians 5. Look what it says beginning in verse 20. Three, let, let, me, let me start there. We have Jesus pictured in this mystery. Marriage isn't created only for us. Marriage is a created and purposely created all the way back in Genesis picture of redemption. We should pick this up. We should pick this up beginning in verse 25 where it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and 
and gave himself up for her. And it's almost like the Holy Spirit just takes over Paul's teaching to husbands and wives and says, now it's time to unfold this, to unpack this. Christ loved the church. You see, the mystery of redemption is that Jesus loves us and the mystery of marriage is that this is the picture we should always be able to look at to be reminded of it. The love of Christ for his people is portrayed by the husband. Christ loves his church. Christ, it says, sacrifices himself for the church. He loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ makes the church his own. He is so passionate about you and about me that in our lostness and in our sin, he lays down his life so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be saved. He graciously takes his own life and not only sacrifices it, but he gives us his righteousness. He takes our sin upon himself. He does all of this because he loves the church. Christ makes the church his own and he makes her ready for this. Notice in verse 26 that he might sanctify her. That means set her apart. He he says there there are the rest of the people in the world and then there are my people. There is the church. And to sanctify means to get us ready as well. Not just to separate us, but get us ready for his presence. How does he do that? By purifying her completely. Look what it says. That I might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Now there's a phrase that kind of strikes us. Is what, what does that mean? By the washing of water by the word. Some people think water here is, the baptism, is baptism. I, I really don't think that's what it is. I think the idea is the washing of that of, of water is the whole idea of, of cleansing, of cleansing. And then he talks about the word cleansing us. Go back real quickly to John 15, 3. John 15, 3, passage we referenced last week for other purposes. But in John 15, 3, look what it says. Jesus says that in verse 2, Every branch that bears fruit, every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes, he, he basically cleans off the stuff that needs to be cleaned off so that he may bear more fruit, but he says, already you are clean. You are clean, why? Because of the word that I have spoken to you. You can look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. In 1 Peter 1, 23, listen to what Peter says there. He says, concerning our salvation, he says, you have been born again, not by perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. The washing of water with the word is the cleansing that takes place in our lives when we hear the word of Jesus, when we hear the gospel. So Jesus brings us his word, the gospel, and that sets us apart. When we believe that what he did really was for us and we seek his forgiveness and we, inv- and we, we make our profession of faith, we are saying, I believe you, Jesus, have done this for me. And when that happens, he cleanses us. He purifies us through that message. And it says he does this so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Now it's looking forward and saying, and now he is going to take us as his people and he's going to keep working on us and he's going to gently but firmly move us in the directions we need to go so that you and I will become holy. So that we will, as it says here, be presented to Christ, we, he wants to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. He says, I am so committed to my bride that I am going to make her absolutely ready for that day when I bring her into my presence, book of Revelation, to the marriage supper of the Lamb where we are invited in as his people and the celebration begins of a union that goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. Everlasting joy in the presence of the Lord. 
Paul is saying, oh, it is so beautiful what Jesus has done for us in making us his bride. And that, that leads his bride, the church, it says in verses 22 through 24, to respond in ways that a wife seeks to demonstrate. As in her, hus- in her marriage to her husband, she seeks to look to him in faith. That is a picture of Christ being trusted by his people and followed in everything. Now, the amazing thing we have to realize is that every husband is called to think about this example as you think about what you're going to be in your marriage. I know that there have been people who've questioned whether or not it's a, it's a smart thing to do, but a very practical question every husband ought to ask himself before he speaks in his marriage, before he makes a decision, before he perhaps too quickly offers correction. A husband ought to ask himself, what would Jesus do? Because Jesus is our example of sacrificial love. Now, I'm not saying that you have to take every aspect of this and every day, well, I have to wash my my wife with the water of the word. In a sense, if I understand that right, that's talking about salvation. So I'm not getting her saved, but, but I should be doing everything I can to help her live out her salvation. In the same way, wives... Uh, This is a tough thing when it says that that you follow your husband, you submit to your husband even as the church does to Christ. But why as believers do we follow Christ and trust him and let him lead? Well, because we know he loves us. And the idea here is when two Christians marry, there should be that understanding that because we love God and love each other, We are able, by the grace of God, to do this. And so a wife, every time she sees her husband make any step toward sacrifice and putting her first, she should do two things. Number one, she should say, that's Jesus caring for me through him. And number two, she should say, thank you, Lord, for my husband, help him, help him become even more like Jesus. And that's our desire for one another. A wife has to recognize her husband can never be all that Jesus is. And yet she can look when she trusts her husband ultimately to Jesus and say, Jesus, I trust you just like the church does anyway. And of course, how long will Jesus' redemption last? How long will Jesus' love last? Brothers and sisters, it lasts forever. What God has joined together, let not man separate, Matthew 19. What does Romans 8 say? What shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Things on earth, things in heaven, any of those things? No. No. You see, our marriages actually have an apologetic purpose. Now, I hope you remember that the word apologetic means an explanatory purpose. If we're explaining our faith to people, we are said to be given, giving an apology. That's, that's at least technical language for it. Your marriage and my marriage, if we are Christians, our marriages are meant to be an explanation to people who need to know something. They're meant to be an explanation of just how much Jesus loves us and just how much we can trust Jesus. And as marriages do this, we begin to see that the reason for marriage goes far beyond just having children, beyond being alone, beyond romance. A watching world can learn the beauties of the gospel as they watch a husband love sacrificially his wife. As they see him putting his own interests aside 
and finding his joy in serving his wife. And they see a wife helping her husband just like Eve, that helper suited just for him, finding the ways that she can help him move forward and trusting God to work in and through him. And together, they demonstrate to those who are watching the gospel. They demonstrate the power of the gospel to take two sinners and to put them together. And you know how they demonstrate or who they demonstrate it to? First of all, to their children. If God gives them children, they, they demonstrate it to their children in their home. They demonstrate it to their neighbors. They demonstrate it to their Christian friends. They demonstrate it to a watching world so that when people say, you guys have a great marriage, you, you have an opening. And by the way, people will say that. <laughs> you know how I know that? Just watch. Next time you go to a wedding reception and people, you know, they do the dance where you have to get out after, you know, you've been married so many years. And then they, you know, keep cutting down the years. Who's been married 10 years? And people leave. And then 20 and then 30 and then 40 and then 50. And you know what? When you see a few couples out there dancing together, 50, 55, 60, you should see the eyes of the people who are all there. <laughs> Probably most, most especially the bride and the groom. Because they're saying to themselves, that's what I want. And there's a lot of people in the world today who look at those kinds of relationships and say, that's what I want. Do you understand that if the church is meant to be a picture to the world of, of the beauties of the gospel and the beauties of Jesus' love, the smallest community is, in fact, the community of husband and wife. And when that works, then that encourages other believers, encourages other un unbelievers as well. We, our marriages become evangelistic. You say, how can I witness to my, to my friends and neighbors? There's lots of ways, but one is by seeing this purpose in your marriage. I, I, let me just suggest this. Um, this is hard. How can we do this? You may be saying, Craig, that, that sounds like a wonderful idea, but you don't know my marriage. You don't know my husband. You don't know my wife. Husbands, if your wives are, are a bit resistant and you're saying, I just don't see how this can work. Can I ask you this? Are, are there any passages in Scripture that talk at all about God's faithfulness to, faith, or faithfulness to faithless people? Are there times when, when the Scriptures speak of him working with people who are rebellious and with people who are resistant and loving them anyway? Wives, you say, how can I trust him in this? Are, are there any passages in the Scripture that talk about the people of God having to trust him in impossible circumstances? Just saying. You may be in a marriage, you say, well, it's not a perfect picture of the gospel. Well, maybe not yet. But maybe it's more of a picture of the gospel than you realize because God saves broken people. So, maybe that's how we do it. We, we, we need to realize, first, a good marriage can always become more intentional. If you have a good marriage, think about these things. Think about inviting other people over. Think about coming alongside other couples and helping them. Think about inviting single people into your life just so that they can see. I, one, of, one of our staff members mentioned that there was a single person that, that they got to be close to when, when this person was a student in college and they just invited them into their lives and that person has told them on numerous occasions, seeing your family and seeing your marriage gave me an understanding of what marriage should be like. And the married couple said, yeah, and, and all the while we were thinking, man, we got to keep this going right because we're... She's watching. What, what, a, what a great relationship that can be built. We can do this even if our marriages have ended by coming alongside other husbands and wives. Maybe you had a marriage that ended in a broken circumstance, maybe through, maybe through death, but you still have something to speak into people's lives, and we need it. Come alongside your married friends. We need our single brothers and sisters to help us. <laughs> and, and I'm not making a plea for babysitters. What, what I'm saying is this. Single people, we need your friendship. We need your fellowship. 
We need your perspective. Because as we're going to talk about next week, it's way too easy for married people to kind of lose sight of some really important things that single people understand that we don't. We need you. And finally, how can we do this? By the grace of God. I, I can't do it myself, and you can't do it yourself, but we can, by the grace of God, find through the Holy Spirit the strength, the wisdom, that he will give us to do this. And all the while you remind yourself you are part of Jesus' bride forever. Forever. Single or married, you have been loved this way. And you are part of the bride. Well, next week we'll talk about singleness and its importance to the body. I'm going to ask if you would stand. I want to pray for us. As we close our service, our, our elders will be at the front here and in the back. And man, maybe you came in here today and, and there's just hurt in your life. Not necessarily even about marriage. There's just something that's going on and you'd love for people to pray for you. We would love to pray for you. Um, maybe you have a question. Maybe something has been said you don't understand. Maybe most of all, when I talk about knowing that you're part of Jesus' people, part of his bride, you're saying, I don't get that. We'd, we'd love to explain that to you. We'd love to, to just talk. So we'll be here. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. And thank you that we can together see the beauty of our salvation, our forever salvation, in the way you've designed marriage we are here as sinners, broken people. And boy, we need your help. And many of us who are married confess we need your help. We want to see our marriages become that picture of Jesus' incredible love for us because a watching world needs to see just how you can change people into something we could never be ourselves. Give us your grace. Give us your strength so that we can give you all the glory. And as we go from here, married or single, Lord, remind us that we go with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ available to us, the love of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit available. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.